for Reva to phone the police. Tests are underway to determine if a serial killer is on the loose in Centurion Pretoria. The dead won't bother you. It's the living you gotta worry about. In a country marked by the harsh reality of 84 daily murders, these are the stories that echo through the reality of our lives in South Africa. Hello, it's Paul Llewellyn, and here we are live on YouTube. This is exciting. Uh, please hit the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already. Joining me, as always, my partner in crime, Gerard Lovaskachny. Hello, Gerard. How are you? Hi, Paul. Hello, everybody else. So, of course, Jared is our former law enforcement officer, current head of LNS Threat Management, helmed the investigative psychology section of the South African Police Service from 2001 to 2016, worked on over 300 serial murder and rape cases, an internationally recognized and renowned expert in forensic psychology, and he is simply known as our profiler. Here we are, Jared, live on the YouTube. Do not swear. <laughs> Wait, no, wait. You see, we're going to have some technical issues, I'm sure, as we go. Let me unmute you. Okay, now you're unmuted. Sorry, Jared. Okay, there we go. Our first technical issue out of the way. Hopefully, it'll be the last. Um, how's it going, Jared? It is going pretty well, Paul. Thanks. Okay, good. So, um, how's, how's life in the world of uh, threat management? Life in the world of threat management is going well. We had a conference last week in Santon. <clears throat> um, for two days, we had some really great uh, international and local speakers basically talking about anything from mass violence incidents. We had the Secret Service from the United States speaking about that to, um, you know, stalking to um, even someone presenting on uh, serial murder. Um, okay. The Center Scene of Rosemary Glover, which I think is something we've mentioned on our channels before on our podcast, uh, that uh, policewoman serial murderer. So yeah, okay. and then we had some nice workshops on the Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. So that was my week last week. Okay. Um, all right. Well, we're going to do so much. We're going to do a couple of things tonight. I mean, first of all, we're just kind of, like I say, testing the test, putting our, dipping our toes into the water of this doing live podcast thing. Um, <clears throat> you know, typically we do pre-records and we get to edit out all the fluffs in between. Um, this one, we're just going to go for it and see what happens. Um, we'll be talking about a specific case as well. Um, we're going to be talking about um, the story of South Africa's youngest ever serial killer, who is also a, a female. So South Africa's youngest female serial killer um, from the town of Jan Kempdorp. So we'll be diving into that one a little bit. Um, please do um, hit like and subscribe on the channel. Um, obviously, the plan from here on out is that we'll be doing this every uh, Tuesday night from 8 to 9. We'll be going live. I think the, the motivation for the live is that we get to engage with the audience and um, folks can join in the chat, post uh, questions, and um, we can address some of that stuff live as we go. Um, and we can have a bit more of a rounded conversation about the cases, incorporating some of that um, our viewer uh, feedback as we go through the show. So please do um, yeah, join in the chat, say hello. It'll be nice to know that you're out there and hit like and subscribe. Um, we'll be doing this, like I say, every Tuesday. And then at nine o'clock, straight after this, we're going to be premiering a whole episode of um, a true crime show um, that we call True Crime Room, hosted by a Canadian friend of ours by the name of Derek Riedler. Who, uh, and you'll be able to see that straight after our chat here. We're going to try and fill the next hour talking about crime and the case of um, Jan Kempdorp and a couple of other things. Um, the episode tonight of True Crime Room that Derek uh, will be discussing uh, will be the case of Anisha and Joey Van Niekirk. So maybe we can just touch on that towards the end of the hour. Um, as a way of introduction to that, which will premiere at 9 p.m. So that's that. Okay, so, Gerard, the state of the nation. How's it going? How's it going in SA? What's the goss from your former law enforcement officers, officer friends and what have you? How are we doing? What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, I don't think we've improved much, you know, since we've had our elections and... Lots of promises were made. Uh, as, as you know, I think in the Northwest province, they're trying to get some illegal miners out from underneath the, 
the ground in the illegal mines. That's sort of going with some kind of reasonable success. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm still not sure if I'm hearing the right kind of words that would make me think that we're going to really get a get on top of the crime stats. Mm. Um, that's, that's yeah. So not the best of news. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think not much has changed, I think, is the bottom line. I mean, there's not much, not improvement, possibly, you know, just a continuation of the trends over the last four or five years where things are just not great. Um, a lot of brain drain still out of the police service, I would imagine. Um, but um, anyway, um, let's that's that. Let's not hop on the <laughs> let's not hop on the state of the nation. I'd like to get into talking about some cases and what have you. Um, anything else I needed to do? Add many? No. All right. So we're going to talk tonight about the case of South Africa's youngest serial killer. It's a case that took place in a little town in the Northern Cape called Jan Kempdorp. Um, Gerard, first of all, let's set the scene a little bit for those. I mean, we've discussed this lots of times on the on the on the audio version of the podcast let's mm. talk let's open up with a kind of a general discussion on serial killers in south africa what is the what is the typical serial killer scenario profile in south africa that we look at and then we'll work our way towards this case which is really a you know a very rare and unusual case mm. yeah so in south africa based on the research that we did a couple of years ago when i was still in the police you know your average age of a serial murderer when we know that they've committed their first crime is 29 years old um obviously in line with our population stats the you know the average serial murderer in south africa is, is a black male um so 29 years old at the time of their first known murder black male and the typical scenario is really them luring someone away with the offer of employment um and through that process luring them to a, to a deserted area that they've checked out beforehand uh, and then they typically would then rape, then strangle them to death. So that's just standard stuff. Of course, you've had people who are younger, we have people who are older, we have people who use different con stories or different stories to get the hold of their victims. But that's kind of the, the standard one in South Africa, you know, using some kind of story to lure your, your victim away. So female serial murderers, really, to be honest with you, we've probably had less than a handful, literally. You know, people often speak about Daisy Demelka as perhaps our first known serial murderess. But technically speaking, she was only convicted of one murder, that, that of her son, if I recall correctly. So, um, you know, it's, it's, we believe that she murdered a few of her husbands, uh, again, for usually for an insurance pout. Um, but that's, you know, if you want to base it on true convictions, then we couldn't really refer to Daisy Demelka as a serial murderess. A great book written by Ted Witter, <clears throat> who um, sort of went and documented it, went into the archives of newspapers from the Times. And, um, you know, really wrote a really good uh, documentary style book about that case, but also weaving into it what was happening in that local environment um, in Johannesburg in those early, early, early 1900s. So that, the next person that we could perhaps call as a female steel room murderess would have been someone like um, Charmaine Phillips, her and her boyfriend, Peter Hundling, in their sort of early mid 80s. So they went on this from Durban, Melmoth, Secunda, and really just kind of robbing and, and killing random guys that they would pick up in a bar or hitchhiking, you know, stealing whatever money that they had um, in their, at their, on their possession. So that's kind of really it when we talk about your female serial murderers until we start to get to someone like Rosemary Glovo from a couple of years ago. Uh, I think she was convicted last year or the year before um, in the High Court. And she was a serving member of the South African police at Timbisa Police Station uh, and ended up killing numerous, you know, family members, etc either by getting a hitman to take them out, or I think she physically killed one or two of the people herself. Um, <clears throat> and essentially that was driven by um, financial insurance policies that she'd taken out on these people. Um, and she was quite dramatic. If you ever watch footage of her in, in, in court, she kind of very much played up to the audience, um, would dress very nicely each day, would kind of pose for the, for the cameras. So she was quite an interesting character. And, and in, interestingly enough, we have another um, case right now also with another member of the South African Police Services, also a female, female cop, who's done exactly the same thing, you know, killing people after taking out insurance policies. So that seems in South Africa that the most frequent thing is going to be, if it is rarely a female, it's going to very often be sort of insurance motivated, which is not your standard serial murder, but it's still 
meets the definition criteria of, of serial murder. Yeah, so so b- big differences when it comes to kind of motivations and what have you. Um, when it, let's talk about youngsters. I mean, like your typical age. What is your <clears throat> typical age group f- f- that people would kind of, you know, start to start to yeah. kill people? Yeah, so like I said, from the research we did, the average starting age was 29 years when their first murder occurred. Okay. Now, the youngest I ever worked on before, well, this case, I think, was just after I left um, the police. A colleague, Bron Stollers, worked on it. Um, but the youngest one I ever worked on was from Friedendal, which is in sort of the up the West Coast, sort of, uh, sort of a winding community, uh, winding, wine farming community. Mm-hmm. And it was a 15-year-old boy who, who raped and murdered someone. He was caught not long thereafter. He was sent sort of sentenced of a, of a sorts because he was a minor to one of these sort of um, reform school for lack of a better word and they get to go home on holidays so fast forward i think just before his just before his 18th birthday he's at home for the holidays and he rapes and murders someone else and then if i recall correctly just after he turned 18 in other words a few weeks later still on holiday he then raped and murdered or try to rape and murder another um, person. So that was the earliest one that I've had. And that was 15 years old uh, when that person started and sort of 18 when they were finally, um, you know, caught for their second and third incidences. Yeah. So, I mean, the context that you, you've kind of provided there really does shine a big spotlight on just how different this particular case then is that we're going to discuss, how unique and how rare it is. Um, I mean, this this is a 12-year-old girl. Um, we're not able to refer to uh, her name um, for legal reasons, obviously, because um, she was a minor at the time of the incidents. Currently, she is yep. back out in the world. So she's she served her um, served out her sentence, and she is she is back in 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 the public. Um, which we can discuss as well, some of the kind of implications of that. But, Gerard, just kind of set the scene. And, well, let's talk about Jan Kempdorp first, this, where, the, where it took place, up in the Northern Cape. Give us a little bit of a, a sense of, of that place. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tiny sort of Northern Cape town. Um, not much going on around it. I don't think there's lots of great career prospects for people who grew up in those kind of communities, unless you're going to be working on a farm somewhere. Which I think you get a lot of that generational stuff. Um, possibly some people working on the mines, but it's really a, a small little town with with may not much happening. To be honest with you. Um, okay, and then so so let's jump into it. What what happened? I mean, what was the? Where can we start on the the story of this case? So yeah, so I mean, this little girl. I think when she comes to the police's attention, she was thirteen years old at the time. Um, but we know, you know, obviously you start your investigation with one case and then often you find about other cases that occurred, might have occurred before, etc. So you don't always start off with the first case that's, that, that occurred. And yeah. that's kind of what happened here. We had um, uh, essentially what happened in, it was October 2000, no, sorry, um, in October 2013 or when it was January. Yeah. Um, and she was essentially walking with another little friend of hers, um, a little four-year-old girl, Rafael, where sort of tagged along. Um, and essentially, at one point, they got to a little sort of dam, like irrigation dam. And um, long story short, she intentionally pushed the little child into the dam and basically let the child drown. And that's really when we have the first um, first incident. And that was a four-year-old little girl. And when, when she was asked afterwards why, she said, no, she just hated her. That's why. And, um, you know, what did she do after she pushed the child into the water? Well, she just sat and watched. So clearly, you know, knowing what she was doing, knowing what the outcome was going to be, didn't really have much emotions. And, and all she really feared, fe- feared was really just getting caught. How, how was, this, how was this, this particular incident received by the police? Was it reported to the police? What, 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 was, what happened when the case was kind of came to light? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite sure initially how this came to light, whether they called a, called a farmer over and basically told them they'd found a body, if I recall correctly. And the, the cops, the farmer obviously then would have called uh, 
would have called the police. Okay, um, but they, I mean, the, the, at this stage, they didn't put these put this incident together with anything else. Um, what what is the next what is the next kind of big step in the in the case? Um, yeah, well, I mean, in terms of how things unfolded, I mean, at mm. one point they eventually do pick her up and start to uh, interview her, um, and she starts to essentially tell them what what she did. She mentioned that earlier in in that year. Um, you know, she pushed another 11-year-old boy um, into the dam, but uh, it was not sort not not very deep, so that person didn't survive. So, you know, we, we we might not have had more than one murder, but we have you know a young kid who was trying to commit another murder or had tried to commit another murder. Mm. You know, so in the eyes of the law, you know, you would have been charged with attempted murder. So, attempted murder means your plan was to actually kill this person. That's why sometimes when people say, well, you've got only one successful murder and one attempted murder, or even two attempted murders, should we then regard this person as a serial murderer? And to my answer is yes, because the definition of an attempted means you are trying to, uh, to actually, in this case, kill someone. So attempted murder means you were trying to kill them, and perhaps just by good luck or good medical intervention or the act of God, you know, the person didn't die, but your plan had been to kill the person. Otherwise, it just would have been an assault or assault GBH you know, kind of case. So essentially, we have an earlier case where she tries to kill someone, a later case where she kills a four-year-old little girl and just really just watches her while this happens. Um, so I definitely think that, um, that that should be treated then as a, as, as a murder series from, from my point of view. And of course, she did a few other things to, to kids, which we can also get into. What is um, what is tip? I mean, children are are rowdy. You know, they like pushing and shoving and wrestling games and that kind of thing. I mean, uh, what what could possibly lead somebody of this age to, you know, kind of these levels of violence, kind of straight out of the gate? Yeah, I mean, look, this is exceptionally rare. I mean, little kids don't commit this kind of intended violence. You, know, you might find little kids do things and don't necessarily understand the consequences. Um, and of course, once they once whatever happened has happened, they then realize what they've done. They can be very remorseful. But this is something different. This little child really didn't express any remorse, even you know after these cases were finalized. You know, to, towards the investigating officer who spent a lot of time with this little girl, just never really seemed to realize how serious what she did was. You know, and then it's, it's a very young age to start throwing around world, words like psychopath, etc. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is not a good start. Um, this is not, like I said, experimenting out of ignorance. Um, it's like some kids, you know, hurt animals, but then when the animal cries they, or whatever screams or makes a noise, they realize what they've done and they, and they don't do that thing again. Mm -hmm. But this wasn't. I mean, this, this child, I'm just looking at my notes here, in total, she pushed three kids into the dam. Um, you know, one of them who, who died, you know, two of them thankfully survived over a space of you know, 2012, then January 2013, and later in 2013. Um, so, yeah, so that's um, not a great prognosis. We'll have to see. Um, mm. You know, 2013, she's now, oh, she's now, she's now 20, 24 years old. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, she was born in 2000. Mm. Very curious to see what she was like. Uh, you know, she was first in sort of a, a children's protected environment, and I think about a poor lady when she turned 18, she went for for sentencing. Um, so, I'd be curious to know how her behaviour was like over these past, you know, um, 11 years while she was in some form of custody. Did she abide by the rules? You know, did she do well at school? That you know, they were that she was getting. Um, how much has changed? Or do we really still have someone who just doesn't have that emotional emotionness that we kind of expect everybody to have to some to some kind of degree? What kind of would she have been put through any kinds of programs once kind of in incarcerated once incarcerated? You know, would there be would she be working with psychologists? You know, being that she's she's so young. Well, I'd like to think so. Um, you know, I'm not too sure exactly where she was eventually sent, but I would imagine that these youth facilities would have psychologists that are seeing most of these kids, some kind of a program. But it's kind of, you know, it's such a rare thing. You know, what do we do for this child? 
Yeah. I mean, you don't, you know, there's not like you can pull off a serial murder treatment manual off the side of the shelf and know what, know what to do. So I think any psychologist, no matter how good you are, you'd be kind of sitting there, what, what, how do I fix this? Mm. And of course, the question is, can it actually be fixed? So yes, I would be very surprised if she didn't have any psychological intervention in these, you know, for 11 years that she was in prison. Can I guarantee it? Well, you know what, nowadays, I can't guarantee anything that correctional services should be doing. <laughs> um, the first step towards any kind of treatment would be identifying kind of what the what the issue is. Can you diagnose somebody who's 12, 13 years old as a psychopath? It, are they too early in their kind of development for that? We'd, we'd usually say it's too early because, you know, people's personality is still forming. You know, and kids can do things that are quite extreme in these young teenage years as their brains are developing and their emotions are developing and hormones are running through them. That, that isn't necessarily a blueprint of how they're going to be for the rest of their life. So that's why we really want to be careful about making a personality diagnosis uh, of any kind. So typically you'd, you'd want to wait at least until they're 18. And even then you want to have to have very clear history, um, you know, that, that supports that. But usually before that date, it will be a, a very kind of tentative diagnosis. You can get something called conduct disorder, which is kind of like yeah. the junior psychopath, if you want to call it that, um, which you can make that finding when they're younger. It wouldn't yet be a personality disorder, but it would be um, a, a di type of diagnosis. You can, of course, make other diagnoses like depression and psychosis and you know PTSD, the standard things. But when it comes to personality, you really want to rather just give this person time to settle down mm. um, because people can really go off the rails when they're 13, 14, 15, but they can kind of get very much back onto those rails as they just sort of grow out of it. But this is very serious stuff. And, you know, when we talk about risk for reoffending, when it comes to violent crime and sexual crime, um, you know, we, you know, typically when you, when, when people are, doing naughty things at a young age, we kind of say, well, if we catch it, we can fix it. And I'm sure that's for like the general naughtiness that you might find, you know, bad behavior, um, bunking school, smoking cigarettes, shoplifting. But when it comes to violent crime and sex crime, um, the earlier you start, the worse the prognosis is. Um, and sometimes there's a double-edged sword because, because people think, oh, well, early starting with violence or sexual crime um, this is now going to, this, this person is a hopeless case, can also mean that people don't put any effort into it. So we have to be careful that we don't write off people. But the research shows us that the earlier you're starting with violent crime and sexual crime, typically the prognosis is going to be quite bad for that kind of behavior to continue throughout adolescence and into adulthood. Um, is there a... Uh... <sighs> Okay, no, let me not ask that question. Um, okay, so we've talked about um, the kind of prognosis being not good. I'd, get, I'd imagine because these are such rare cases, there's not a, a handbook for how to deal with this kind of case. You know, it's, um, you know, would, if, you were, if you were looking to come up with a, 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 a means of treating this young girl, would you look at other cases? Would you look to kind of, you know, in other parts of the world, perhaps? Or, um... yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be worth it. I mean, I don't know of any other cases like this in South Africa, so that's how rare it is. Mm. Um, so, yes, so one would turn to hopefully to research that you try and look, look up these cases, similar things, what happened, what the prognosis was. You know, you'd also want to speak to the, the family, mother, father, if they're available, or the other kids, you know, troublesome or not. Is this a pattern of behavior that, you know, the parents or one of the parents might have exhibited also? Um, so you'd kind of want to explore all of that to hopefully give you a better idea of how we're going to sort of proceed forward. Yeah. But if you don't really have any empathy for other people, that's the difficult thing to learn. Mm. You know, um, you never really had it. And we have, besides these three cases I mentioned, when one was drowned at the dam and two other kids on separate occasions were pushed into the dam water but survived. We also have it in October, October of that same year, 2013, where um, it takes a little girl with her um, out to go plant some baroch 
and, and essentially uses a stick to 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 rape the child. Um, you know, that would have been incredibly painful. In fact, part of the stick broke off inside of her and she was bleeding. And then she admits that she did the same thing um, before the three-year-old child. So you have, you know, three times, one attempted mur one murder, two attempted murders, and, and two rapes. So you essentially have zero rape for sure. You've met the two, two minimum criteria. And as I said, you know, she should be looked at and viewed from a risk point of view as a serial murderer because of those one successful and two attempted. So... You know, you really do need to have some level of empathy already to make any therapy work. Because if you really don't feel like what you did really was wrong, you don't feel bad about it, then what's your motivation to change, you know? Um, that's really why something like the psychopath diagnosis is very damning for your prognosis for the future, for your risk. Mm. Because without that, that's kind of like feeling bad about something or worrying about something or the consequences is really what makes us stay on this straight and narrow, you know? I don't want to feel bad about because I, I don't want to do that again because I'll feel bad. Or I don't want to do this because I will go to jail and that's not something that I want to happen. But if those kind of driving forces aren't there, you know, then you unfortunately, you know, what's going to motivate this person to try and change instead of just sitting there being bored, possibly going through the motions just to get through whatever program that they have to go through. Is there a system in place to to monitor these types of people once they are released back into public? Is there a... So if you if you get released on parole, then yes, parole you okay. can impose conditions. That's why parole is very important. Um, you know, because you, you can say that you will report twice a week to the police station. You will go for these community counselling sessions you will go for community service. Uh, so you can impose whatever conditions, obviously within reason, um, that the person has to abide by while they're on parole. Um, if the person just reaches the end of their sentence, you know, let's say somebody was very bad, didn't get parole because they were always misbehaving. Once you get to your 10 year sentence, you can you just walk right out the gates and can't even ask you where you're going. So that, and that's not a great scenario because you're setting someone up to fail. So parole actually is really important because we can release you out into the community. Someone has to agree to look after you. You have to abide by certain conditions. And if you can't, you will get pulled back into the prison. So it allows us to have this monitoring period in which we can pull the person back in if things don't work well. Um, that's why parole is very important. A lot of people kind of fight against it. Now, I do think we shouldn't get to the point where we're giving parole halfway through your sentence. For me, that's that's a joke. Um, you know, I think if you if you have a 15 year sentence, maybe two or three years prior to your final release date, you should be starting to be considered for parole. But I think halfway through your sentence really kind of makes it feel like and the correctional services will try to give you parole at that point in time. I think sometimes parole boards think that you're supposed to be released and when you reach your minimum detention period and only if you've done really bad stuff should you be kept longer and i think that also needs to be tweaked i mean this parole system is just in general uh, quite a joke yeah um i recommend that folks go back and listen to some of the previous episodes that we've done where we've really deep dived into the parole system um because i mean we're at an interesting time you know we had a whole lot of serial killers being caught 25 30 years ago um, and all of those maximum sentences are coming up and, um, you know, there are some, some interesting people, no doubt, being released back into the public that, you know, we're largely not aware of. I mean, you know, the news is so busy down south that um, these things get kind of lost, lost a little bit, don't they? Um, I would just like to say that it's exciting. Thanks, everyone. If you're um, jumping onto the live stream, it's this is me and Gerard doing profile alive for the first time. Um, this is kind of our test case, uh, our test episode. Um, we didn't do much uh, shouting about the fact that we were going to do this just because um, we want to have the space for an hour to be, um, to be able to, to, to mess up a little bit. And <laughs> who knows what technical um, glitches might have been sneaking into the, the, the program. But um, so far, so good. Um, uh, it, it, really nice to be also able to engage with you guys. I see we've been getting starting to get some messages in. Um, should we take a question? We've never taken a question before. We actually have a question from Julian. I think it's Julian Soter. 
Let's pop it up there. So Julian's asking, what are some common misconceptions about profiling? Sure. I think if you, obviously if you, what you know about profiling is primarily what you've seen on TV shows, which are not documentary style, but more just entertainment shows. It really gives you this idea that your profilers are the, the investigator of the case. They're out there on crime scenes. They're interviewing suspects. And <clears throat> the reality is, the majority of profilers out there are not doing all of that. Um, you know, even FBI profilers, they're typically not at the crime scene because they're only invited into the case, you know, a while afterwards. Maybe mm. if it's a series that they're helping with and there's a new body that comes up, they might maybe if they're in the right time, the right place. So the idea that this profiler is the lead of the lead of the investigation and the person who's making all the decisions and interviewing all the suspects. It isn't really like that. Now, ironically, the, the place where it was the closest like that is actually in South Africa, in my old unit, where there were some instances where I was in charge of the task team, like the Quarry Murder series, which we've spoken about, and one stalker case, which I was literally the investigating officer. Um, but, but typically, you were joining an investigation. And even with the FBI, you know, they, they, their profilers all sat originally in Quantico, and then now it's a little bit further down the road from Quantico. Um, and like I said, they don't have profilers, FBI profilers scattered around America. You all sit centralized just near Quantico. So you only get involved in a case when the local police department invites you in. You, it's not like on TV, you see the feds are here to take over. If it's a murder series or any other case, unless it's across state boundaries, you have to be invited in, which usually means you're arriving there after the fact and after the crime scene. And like I said, unless you happen to be helping them at the time with an active murder investigation series, series investigation, and you're on site when another body is found, then you would go to the crime scene. So a lot of that stuff is not really happening in, in real life. And also I think what's what's a misperception that people have is that profilers are all psychologists. In fact, it's it's almost the rarity that you get a profiler who's a psychologist, at okay. least a pro 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 professional one. A lot of people out there calling themselves profilers who aren't really profilers. Um, and again, the situation in South Africa where that it actually is like that because, you know, I was a profiler, Mika Pistorius was a psychologist, I was a psychologist. But in general, your profilers um, in the professional profiling community are, are actually investigators who have subsequently obtained profiling training. So that's another misconception that you're all psychologists that are, that are out there. I think yeah. that's the main ones that people really get wrong. Yeah. In America, if you were if you were to be a profiler on a if you were invited to be a profiler on a case in a at a, in a kind of a local level, they could invite people from you know a a, prof, a professional profiler from the community, if you like. You know what I mean? Like uh, they don't just use yeah. the FBI guys if they want to call in a profiler. They would typically you have like service providers that they call into a case. Is that right? And in South Africa, to work on a case, you need to be a cop. Simple as that. Yeah. So, so can you? It also dependent on on your how your police is set up. So in South Africa, we just have the South African Police Service. So if it's a stolen cell phone, South African Police Service investigates that. If it's a terrorism case, the South African Police Service investigates that. So we only have one, effectively one police service that does investigations into crime. Um, and for that, we had one profiling unit, the old the investigative psychology section. But now you look at something like the United States, there are 17,000 law enforcement agencies and they're all independent of each other. So each little police department is its own law enforcement agency, it hires its own police members, it has its own uniform, its own policies, its own procedures, and its own jurisdiction where it can operate. And outside of that jurisdiction, you're no longer a cop. So it's literally, for those of us in South Africa, it would be as if Santon Police Station is an independent police service. And then you might have Honeydew, and that will be its own independent police service. So it's very fragmented, which means, you know, that those independent law enforcement agencies can do pretty much whatever they want because they're not beholden to anybody. And then, of course, you've got the state police, state troopers is often a term used. And, of course, your federal stuff like your FBI, DEA, uh, etc. So that means that there's a lot of scope for those local agencies to use whoever they want. And maybe you find that... 
in a community at a university there's a guy who puts himself out there as a profiler and he's got some kind of relationship with that local police department they might use that person it's not it's not a regulated industry um, so it's unlike for example psychology in south africa where there are laws that determine who can call themselves a psychologist uh, it's a protected title you know you can get you can go to jail if you're pretending to be a psychologist and not really one so it's it's not really as um uh, it's not regulated so there's, there's nothing to stop anybody from calling themselves a profile i mean i know people here in south africa who on linkedin refer to themselves as offender profilers and and i know them and i know their backgrounds and honestly uh, i i would really not call them profilers but there's no law that says you, they're not allowed to call themselves profilers um what would you recommend to folks um out there as the best route to being somebody that you would consider to, to becoming someone that you would consider to be a qualified profiler? Um, cool. Currently in South Africa, the only place you can really get that level of training um, would be in the investigative psychology section. Mm -hmm. And that has people that are experienced detectives in it. It has some psychologists in it. And in more recent years, they've also had criminologists. Um, so it's there that you would probably be the closest to learning how to actually become a profile. Because if you look at sort of the, the one guideline that exists, the um, International Criminal Investigative Analysis Fellowship, the ICIAF, which was essentially originally people who'd been through the FBI training. And once the FBI stopped training non-FBI people, the ICIAF was formed like as an association for alumni. Um, but also people realizing that in our agency, how are we going to get our people trained now that the FBI isn't training people? And they basically reformulated that curriculum that the FBI was following. Mm. And basically, if you are in law enforcement and you have someone who's prepared to supervise you who is an ICIF profiler, you can then sort of be mentored. Um, but there is a set curriculum of things you need to undergo. And a lot of those things are things you're probably only going to be able to get training in if you are actually in law enforcement. Um, so some of the examples would be things like... Um, you know, homicide investigators course, um, blood stain pattern anal anal analyst course, um, forensic pathology training, uh, crime scene ballistics training, uh, arson and fire profiling training. So a whole, you know, like 20 different courses that you have to do um, as part of that ICF curriculum and also would include vis um, experiential visits to your to three different agencies of which one would have been the FBI. You know, so that's kind of the standard and benchmark that, that the RCIF has. So that's very difficult to get that level of exposure and training um, in, the, in the private world. Okay. Um, all right, great. Well, thank you, Julian, for your question. Um, I hope we um, shed some light. Um, you know, there's so much to talk about in this. The one question I had was, what is the current state of the investigative the investigative psychology unit at SAPS. What's um, what's kind of going down there currently? I'm sure you've still got friends yeah. that side. So it, it still exists. Um, I think at the head office unit, because in my days when I started, it was just three of us mm. uh, when I joined in 2001. I was only psychologist and Colonel Mybert was still there till today. And at the time then, back then, it was Captain Evans. You know, now, even before I left, we had decentralized to open up branches in each of the nine provinces, which might have had one or two people, two or three people at the most. Some of the provinces had a, another psychologist. Um, I think at the moment, we just had recently Colonel Clark, who had been the psychologist. I think she joined about a year after I left, probably about 2017. And she's recently okay. resigned from the police. Um, I think there's one other psychologist now in the unit uh, and, and spanned across any of the, the provincial units also. Um, so there's still a fairly strong head office component, but I don't know how strong some of the provincial units are. Um, and as I said, probably I think there's just one psychologist left. One of the big problems that after, after I left, not because I left, but after I left is that they really didn't have a lot more training. There's been hardly any training for people since I've left. So the psychologists would join, um, and you're not trained to do this work during your normal clinical psychology training or counseling psychology training. So it's a, it's a job that you arrive with some benefits that you're a psychologist, of course, but you still have to be trained. And that didn't really happen after I left, even with the psychologist joining, there wasn't really any of the sort of training that we used to have when, when, when I was there. So the unit still exists. 
um, you know, Elmarie Mayberg, Katya Mayberg is still there. She's one of the founder members of the unit. Um, but, you know, she's also getting close to the point where she's, she could consider retiring. I think that mm. next year she could consider early retirement. Um, a couple of the older guys have retired, Colonel DeLonga, that, that's uh, featured on some of our episodes on Profiler Podcast, has re- re- uh, retired early about two years ago. Um, Aubrey Sechwalea, very experienced sexual offense investigator, retired. So a lot of the guys that had had, and ladies that had had a lot of experience in the unit are actually retiring. Mm. And the difficulty, once you lose that backbone of core experienced people who will help mentor the new crowd, et cetera, and you're not bringing in further training, um, your view, it, it's difficult to see because you, you're basically left starting from scratch and hoping you mm. reinvent the, real, the wheel in the right shape, which that's not great. Yeah, you kind of have to go back and start from scratch to a large degree, Ben. You know, and it's not like they're inviting the likes of yourself back in to kind of help to oh. make sure that 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 the next class that's coming through are as qualified and capable as your class has been. In, in, in fact, I've never been asked to come and give training to anybody since I left. Yeah, I'd, I'd extended the offer, um, but I've never been asked to come and give training workshops to work with the new psychologists or some of the new people to give some mentoring to anyway sort of help them develop their skills and I, unfortunately that's the SA police's attitude that I've seen in many instances that if someone if someone resigns in other words you leave before retirement um, it's kind of like you get put on essentially like a bit of a shit list in a way if I can use that word you know mm-hmm. you left us so we want nothing to do with you um, yeah. definitely we're not going to ever pay you to do something for us when you used to work for us. I mean, that's not even a huge no-no. But my, my offer for training was not was not one where I expected to be paid. So SAPS kind of shoots itself in the foot in that way that people mm. who, who resign, they kind of look down very natively at. But even people who reach retirement age who might be prepared to help supervise people, to mentor people, they just don't ever make use of that resource. There's no mechanism officially whereby they could get those retired people who maybe want to donate two mornings a week to go through dockets to help supervise dockets for new detectives, etc. Um, mm. That just doesn't happen. Um, so SAPS does kind of shoot itself in the foot in that sense. It, it doesn't also have the concept of consultants. Let's get someone who's a, you know, 10 hours a month consultant. Yeah. And that person will come in you know, five hours on it this day and then two weeks later for five hours and just be there to help people discuss cases, um, inspect dockets, etc. They don't, they don't do that. And, and uh, for whatever reasons that they don't, they don't do it. And they, they lose out on, on really leveraging, as I said, a lot of experienced people who might be quite prepared, you know, because I mean, retirement for a cop is often boring because, you know, you've spent your whole life in a very high paced job um, and you think it's going to be great sitting at home doing nothing but after the first two weeks you're bored as hell so i think there would be people who would be willing to help it or whether the, whether getting those people to come in um give training on the detective training because mm-hmm. at one point you know that whole six months detective training course which had multiple presenters i think only one of them had ever actually been a detective so you had people who were literally just teaching out of a book um Oh, we've got a thumbs up sign there. Hey. so someone who i mean and if you're going to just have people who have no experiential knowledge you can may as well just give people the manual and say read it yourself because mm. you not you can't answer my questions. Oh God forbid you you answer what you think is the right answer, but you have no experience where that's coming from, and you teach people the wrong thing. Then rather do a video course that people just sit and stare at because I mean, what would be the point of teaching if you have a psychologist? People having psychology lectures by someone who's not even a psychologist, you know, it would, it would seem so bizarre to us. Remind us what um, has happened to the to SAP structurally to kind of hinder the, you know, the way I understand it is you have SAPS as the law enforcement organization for the country, and then you have individual police stations with competent, capable cops in the police stations, but then you have these centralized units with really the specialist cops where they kind of gather together in Pretoria, the best violent crime cops for example all working together on solving a particular type of crime and if you identify a serial a series in a province then that 
elite team is deployed from central to go and to handle it. But that doesn't seem to necessarily, it's kind of the case, but also not the case. What is the, like structurally, how do, what's the situation at the moment? So, so this, this goes and back to 2006 when Salibi was the then head of the police. As many of us might know, he was later found guilty of corruption and sentenced to jail time. Um, he, in his infinite wisdom, shut down our specialized units. So that included the sexual offenses units, the firearms units, serious and violent crime units, um, really ones that were dealing with the really high profile, complex, impactful, violent crime cases. Um, and essentially those units were successful for a couple of reasons. Firstly, you could only get into one of those units if you were hand selected and you had to be a very good detective. So you cherry picked the really good cops to join a serious and violent crime unit, for example, which was in the old days more your murder and robbery kind of unit. Um, and secondly, that you had usually three standby groups and each group would have a week of the month where they're on standby. And there might be 12 people in that standby group. And if there's a case that comes up, there's a murder that's part of your mandate, that whole standby group of, say, 13 people would go out to the crime scene. Today, I, I might be on rotation, so it's going to be my docket. But I have those other, those other 11 people um, there to do whatever I need them to do. I might say to someone, you go make inquiries amongst those houses over there. And if there's some information, you go follow it up for me. And I'll stay here and make sure the crime scene's been done properly. Um, you make sure those exhibits, those fingerprints are taken to the fingerprint records to see if we can ID someone. So you have this team of experienced people there to make sure the crime scene was properly done, but also there to follow up on immediate information. And it's kind of because of that that you often had those units being very successful. But then, like I said, in 2006, Jackie Celebi shut down the serious and violent crime unit. They shut down the um, sexual offenses units. Those have thankfully been opened up since then. And it kind of became like up to each province how big major crimes are going to be dealt with. And this is exactly why we had what we had with the Oscar Pistorius case. Because when that happened, you know, we didn't have these um, specialized units. That would have gone to Pretoria Serious and Violent Crime Unit mm. and would have been dealt with far more efficiently from the start instead of that initial, you know, chaos that ensued until Mike von Ort, Captain von Ort, was eventually assigned the docket. Ironically, he was an ex-serious and violent crime detective, an ex-murder and robbery detective, so he was really, really good. Um, and that was just one of the biggest problems. We, we, we don't even nowadays have homicide units. You know, we have the worst, um, you know, some of the worst crime murder rates in the world, but we leave our murders up to two or three detectives at each police station will be responsible for investigating any unnatural death. So that could be a car accident, that could be a suicide, that could be a guy who fell off the roof while he's cleaning his gutters, and of course, yes, a murder. Now we've got three guys in a station who will deal with any of those things, and today it's my turn, I take this case. So it's not a group of detectives, it's one guy. And that person might be sharing his vehicle with those other two detectives that he works with. Um, and he's got 30, 40 dockets. We're setting the detectives up for failure, which is why I think our, our current murder solving rate is, I think, 12% sure. for murders that get involved. That's horrifying. I'd like to see That's what the curve looks like over the last 20 years. I mean, it surely wasn't that in 2000. I don't know what the exact figures was, but I can definitely say it was not down yeah. to 12%. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're not seeing really kind of the system adapting to try to address these issues that have been created? No, what we did see kind of around about 20, 2008, 2009, 2010, a big improvement in the forensic side of things. Okay. But then also we've had our scandals with, you know, General Pashlan, who at one point was from about 2009, 2010, was appointed as head of forensics. And actually things started to become very functional at forensics, you know, we, there was a purchasing of lots of equipment, pointing of new people, um, um, you know, um, you know, good equipment, you know, uh, turnaround times being, you know, people pushed to make sure that they're, they're, they're dealing with things quickly. Um, then he was made the acting national commissioner, which uh, I didn't think was a bad idea because he was a very, very smart guy. But then, of course, out come some corruption allegations. And even until today, he's still awaiting trial for corruption case, uh, cases against him, which, I mean, I don't know if they're ever going to be able to actually proceed to trial with that. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a glimmer of hope um, 
it definitely the forensics lab. And I think, unfortunately, since he left, things have just kind of crumbled and gone um, backwards in terms of the forensics laboratory. And, you know, it's it's such a complex thing. You can't just have the detective doing their job. You have to have the crime scene people doing their, their job properly. You have to have the forensics people doing their job properly. Mm. You have to have prosecutors doing their jobs properly. Otherwise, you just, it's such, there's so many different moving um, parts in a proper investigation and prosecution that they all have to be working literally at 100%. Yeah. Because if you don't have then you have something that could render an item of an exhibit in the Missoula court. Um, and, you know, until you actually work on murder, murder cases or any investigation, you realize the, the admin and the nitty gritty paperwork that has to be done perfectly to, to actually get a successful conviction in court. So and if, if all of those things aren't working properly, then we're not going to have success. And, and sadly, even our prosecutors nowadays, you know, I've sat in some courtrooms and I've been appalled at the shocking behavior um, of prosecutors who clearly were very incompetent. Now, you still get some very good ones, don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. But I'm just worried about are we creating this next generation? Do we have people there that can mentor these really motivated young people into being, you know, good prosecutors. And I know some very experienced prosecutors who will say to me, you know, I used to try and help juniors, but they would get very, you know, um, almost see it like you're attacking them um, if you try to help them or correct them. Um, you know, as any junior person, you don't know everything. Mm. Um, but it's almost as if it seemed like, don't you tell me what to do, older, more senior person. So they kind of <laughs> realized, okay, well, I'm going to back off and it's not my problem then. And the results are, you know, because of people's arrogance, you think they know everything just because they have a LLB degree. You get things not functioning well in the courtroom. And if that prosecutor doesn't bring it all together in the courtroom, you're mm. not going to have success. Well, we have lots of um, time to get into all of the kind of detail around all of these topics. Um, as you know, we are live right now here on YouTube and um, we'll be doing this every Tuesday from 8 to 9 p.m. And then at 9 o'clock, we'll be premiering for the next 12 weeks, I think, um, a new episode of a series called True Crime Room with Derek Riedler, uh, our Canadian friend, and um, talking about um, local cases as well. So tonight, um, talking about the Joey and Anisha Fanico case. Um, also, thanks very much for joining in the chat. Um, I mean, like I say, we kind of uh, we've done this very much on the hush, so that a bit of a, a bit of a test hour to see that um, that we don't kind of fall into any major technical um, dif dilemmas or difficulties. Um, but we've had some people joining along. Here we have uh, here we go. T. Breitenbach, this is awesome. I'm a big fan of Gerard. There you go, Gerard. No, another another one for the fan club. And then we've got we were talking about the law students. We've got Melissa. Uh, as a fourth year law student, the whole profile of you is really interesting and getting in the mind of the killer, figuring out who they are without actually knowing them. And um, yeah, Jared is certainly our expert at kind of giving us insights on how you would do that. So, uh, Melissa, make sure that you tune in every Tuesday and um, we'll be able to pick Gerard's um, immensely knowledgeable brain on all of these great subjects. Um, you know, talking about the state of... Um, of the police and some of the structural challenges. I guess one of the sad things is that as the system becomes more dysfunctional, then you get good, co you know, the go good cops that want to work in an efficient system get frustrated out of that system, don't they? Mm. Yeah, I mean, various things. I mean, if, if there's a lot of corruption, you also then eventually just have to keep your head down and do your own job and navigate around that. Um, but yeah, for sure, you know, you get a lot of guys who you know, leave uh, investigators who leave the police with those years of experience and training that they might have had, and then go into the private sector working for banks or, you know, most big corporations now have their own in-house investigators. And who do you think those are? Those are mostly ex-cops that are sitting in those positions who, yeah. you know, because they get paid a pittance. I mean, I was quite shocked the other day when I, I saw a, a Lieutenant Colonel's pay slip. I honestly thought it was going to be at least double of what it was. It was I mean, this is people who've been the cops for, you know, two decades or more, and they're earning a salary that I think, and how do you survive on that, you know, if you definitely, if you've got a family that's supporting you or kids, you know, we, we, we pay our police badly. And, yeah. you know, in other parts of the world, developed parts, you know, Europe, um, United States, being a cop is actually a pretty good salary. 
um, you really, by the time you retire, and remember, cops in America on average retire after 20 years of service, not when they hit a certain age. Mm. So if you joined when you were, say, 22, by 42, you're on full retirement with full pension, and you can either go to another you know, law enforcement agency and you know, start working again, and you're getting your pension in the background, or start a completely separate career. Mm. Um, and partly because of that is they realize the psychological and physical toll uh, it puts on your body being a cop. And that's why they sort of, you know, 20 years is the limit where they feel that you know, any longer and you know, you're putting too much of a toll on a person. Um, and also a lot of places in the rest of the world, you know, you have to have a degree before you can become a cop. Yeah. So it is really a, a well-educated position and a well-paying position. Um, sadly, you know, in the United States, I think the, 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 the average sentiment seems to have turned against law enforcement that law enforcement are seen as the bad guys um, and you hear these things like defund the police etc so they're really struggling to get people in certain certain states in the u.s to actually join the police because they reckon okay. i'm not going to put up with all the harassment from the community because this the general sentiment is so negative towards the police these days yeah. so yeah i mean it's better paid has its own challenges of course um and you know if we're paying people peanuts i mean a constable i mean I think if you're getting out like 3,000 rand a month, uh, that's a lot. So why, do, why are we surprised when there's corruption? Yeah. Why are we surprised people are motivated to put their best in it when you're getting paid literally peanuts? Exactly. Um, the police, you know, we need the police to be better. Um, and, you know, the, I guess my last question on this t subject, we, I mean, we strayed quite badly away from um, our discussion about Jan Kempdorp. We can just wrap that one up as well, I think. But, um, <clears throat> um, yeah, I guess the, the, the thing about, about the, 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 the brain drain out of the police is that, like I say, it's just, it's kind of irreversible, isn't it? But like you were saying, if you... You lose that you lose that knowledge and then you not only lose their ability within the police service but you lose that passing on of 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 knowledge which is which is a shame yeah. um what can we do what can you know what should we do as the public to 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 start to turn the tide on these types of things i mean obviously the electorate voted and there's been a bit of a shift in the politics of the country but don't know how much of a, a change that has really made but you know, any thoughts, a first thought on what it's can we do? I, I think, I don't know what the final solution is to everything, but I do think we need to try and hold our police accountable. And when we get bad service, complain to the appropriate places. You know, it doesn't really help much to complain towards a person who's giving you the bad service. You can do that, of course. But then you really do want to go above to that person's supervisor, the station commissioner, your local politician who covers that ward where that police station is mm -hmm. and try and get more formal complaints because I think we just are on a point where we just expect the police to be useless so we don't do anything about it. Yeah. You know, um, if a cop tries to bribe us, do we, do we ever contact the corruption line and just say that that was so-and-so, he tried to bribe me. Maybe if they're getting 20 calls about the same person, they might realize, okay, we need to perhaps monitor this person more closely. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, we do need to hold, try and hold people accountable. I know it's difficult because the police obviously have a power position of authority over us. Some of us might feel I just don't want to get involved. What could they do to me, make my life difficult? But if, but then we are allowing bad service, um, unprofessional service to continue because we're not placing any consequences for people who actually do that kind of bad service. Yeah. All right, Gerard. Well, um, like I say, I mean, the, I, I think an interesting discussion just to kind of a lot of the stuff that we've covered in previous episodes of the podcast but now that you can see our faces i guess it's nice to um to to to, to kind of uh, yeah just to recontextualize these things for the viewers um as we enter into our new era of a tuesday night 8 p.m live podcast and then uh, obviously you can share the the link to the show um and please do go, you know, spread the word that um, Profiler is going to be um, going to be here live every Tuesday, and then um, and then remains and then, available. And then, true, right? yeah, yeah, that you can watch, you can watch or listen any time after that as well. Um, and um, yeah, True Crime Room also with Derek um, starting now at nine o'clock in the next thirty or forty seconds. Um, so you can jump onto that as well. Um, yeah, this is look. This is our first hour. We're 
playing around with, you know, we just wanted to put our foot in the water and have a, uh, and kind of break the ice. Um, we'll be back next week at eight o'clock with an episode and we'll be diving into, again, these, you know, just discussing the issues around crime and justice and the the criminal justice system in South Africa and the rest of the world. Um, obviously, we really want you to at home to join in with the conversation. So yeah, please jump on the chat. That's going to be a really exciting thing to do um, as we kind of explore what we can do with this format um, on this platform and um, see where it takes us. Um, we really want to try and um, yeah, up our game on the on the true crime front. Um, I'm also going to get used to pressing the buttons and talking and thinking all at the same time, um, which is an interesting endeavor. Uh, thank you for your comments, those who joined the chat. Um, Gerard, thanks, man. Um, you know, maybe we'll wrap up Jan Kemp Top next week. <laughs> and we'll jump into another case as well. I mean, society. yeah. Here it goes. Um, hopefully she's getting a little bit of retaining a little bit of counseling here and there though and um every now and again someone's keeping an eye on what's going on there because as we discussed it's not the um it's not the most common of cases is it um all right great guys well that's been that then thank you for tuning into profiler please do hit like if you've been watching our we'll be putting out more word that we're doing this now um now that we kind of like i say broken the back of it um so uh yeah please tell your friends hit like please do subscribe it's so important and um, we're going to be do adding a whole bunch of other stuff into the mix one thing we'll be able to do is bring some nice rich media into these conversations you know clips from interviews we've done with people in the past um on various cases um you know crime scene photographs all of that kind of stuff we'll be kind of loading that up as we get better and um yeah, you'll be able to, I think, get a really good hour. And of course, pose your questions to the man himself, the profiler, Gerard Lovaskakny. Um, it's been great. Um, thank you, Gerard, um, for your Thanks, time. Paul. Thank you, everybody. And um, yeah, to, to your fans, thank you for watching. To um, our fans, thank you for watching. And um, we'll be back again next week at 8. Jump over and catch um, True Crime Room with Derek. And uh, tell us what you think. Please comment. Again, like, subscribe, share. Um, that's the that's the plan from here on out, I think. Hey? Yep. Cool. Cheers. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, guys. And uh, we'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.